Proclamations of Ireland are among the most important sources for our understanding of how Ireland was governed from Dublin Castle in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. This makes the Irish Manuscript Commission's five volume series an essential source for the writing and understanding of how the state exerted its authority in Ireland across several centuries. In England, proclamations were issued directly by the monarch and his or her Privy Council. But in Ireland, it was the Lord Lieutenant, Lord Deputy or the Lord's Justices in tandem with the Irish Privy Council that had authority to draft and to issue them. A proclamation was an official notification of policy, announcing or updating the population on the business of government, be that the summoning of parliament, changes in taxation rates or collection methods, arrest warrants for criminals or rebels, enforcement of policies, the commencement or postponement of legal terms, declarations of war or of danger and the need for vigilance, and any number of other matters that the government decided that the public needed to be aware of. To quote the editors Jimmy Kelly and Marianne Lyons in the introductory essay to these volumes, they wrote, the proclamation was readily resorted to as a means of both communicating political decisions to the public and of advancing and articulating policy. Proclamations were drafted by the members of the Irish Privy Council alongside the officials who were charged with implementing policy. Once a proclamation was drafted by the council, an order was then issued from council to the Lord Chancellor to instruct his staff to authorize the proclamation, a process known as engrossing. Once engrossed, the proclamation would have had final approval known as passing under the Great Seal of Ireland. The text would have then been sent to an official printer so that copies could be made and distributed. At their simplest, the proclamations provide an insight into government policy. While legislation passed by the Irish Parliament may outline a policy, it was often through proclamations that it was implemented or adapted. As a result, many of the proclamations are technical and bureaucratic, especially those that deal with taxation or land ownership. The Irish Manuscript Commission's volumes have particular significance because we know that within the now destroyed Public Record Office of Ireland, there were multiple series of proclamations. These records ran from 1618 to 1829, alongside the bureaucratic papers that led to the publication. This is of course a terrible loss, but it makes the IMC's work all the more impressive as the team that compiled these volumes were remarkably thorough in combing through the archives, libraries and repositories to identify replacement copies for the destroyed records. But in these volumes, we can see records from here at the UK National Archives at Kew, and there's one of them in front of me, the British Library and the Society of Antiquities in central London, as well as the Bodleian Library at Oxford and Cambridge University Libraries. In Ireland, original records were sourced at the National Library, Marsh's Library and the King's Inn Library in Dublin, as well as from Trinity College and other places. These were then transcribed, annotated and compiled into these uh, highly accessible volumes. As texts within themselves, they provide historians with a remarkable wealth of information about government policy. While some are quite short and merely provide updates to current policies, others ran to several pages and were quite technical. This was particularly the case for tax or land ownership matters needed attention. Now, the documents are not simply important for the information they related, but they provide many other types of insights for historians. With each proclamation being signed by members of the council, we can build up a picture of who was politically active or where they focused their energies. Councils might have a notional membership of 15, 20 men, but we can see who the core members were. This can often be impression of someone's career, especially if there is only a relatively small surviving archive of their correspondence. Through the proclamations, we can see them in action, as it were, defining and implementing government policy. In a similar way, the proclamations related to taxation give a clear picture of those officials at a local level who were charged with ensuring each county or region paid what was expected. The destruction of the Public Record Office in 1922 obliterated much of the records related to government revenue for the early modern period, but the proclamations at least give us an insight into who the officials were. I'm most familiar with the first volume, which covered the restored King Charles II's reign between 1660 and 1685. And these proclamations reflect the government's business and its response to external events. In the 1660s, we see a focus on the re-establishment of government the judiciary and the Church of Ireland, as well as the need to quickly raise revenue for the government, which was broke at the restoration. There is also an abundance of proclamations concerning land ownership, as this was the major political issue for the first decade after 1660. 
In the 1670s, the content of the proclamation reflects a more confident and assertive government, but this was undone by the hysteria of the late 1670s when the confected popish plot, a supposed Catholic attempt on the king's life spread to Ireland. This again died down in latter years of Charles II's reign, and we see a more steady stream of proclamations related to the normal business of government. My favorite proclamation is this one here. It dates from the 1st of October, 1669. And this was one issued by the new uh, Lord Deputy, John Lord Roberts, and relates to officials who had taken documents at a Dublin castle and not returned them. All current and former officials were given an amnesty of three months to return any papers they had related to government at Dublin Castle or else, and I quote, they will answer the country at their utmost perils. So the five volume series that makes up the proclamations of Ireland remains an unsung feat of scholarship, comprising records from multiple institutions and repositories and was compiled and produced to the highest standards and is a testament to the ethos of the Irish Manuscripts Commission.